Hello, welcome to week six when the topic uh, of conversation this week is Iron Age peoples. If you've already read Carol Thomas's article, you will have discovered there are at least 30 different uh, peoples that she mentions throughout the Mediterranean during the Iron Age. This list is not exhaustive. There's I'm sure so many identities out there that we are uh, unaware of and uh, or certainly unaware of what they called themselves or what others called them. I can't talk about all 30 people and I think you'll be very grateful for that. But I think I would like to highlight two of the most prominent peoples in the Mediterranean during the Iron Age that are not typically discussed i.e. they're not Roman and Greek. They're not Roman in part because the Romans didn't really exist. By the Iron Age, we have a tiny little settlement in the Tiber. There's certainly uh, no threat to anybody around them and, and definitely not anything like an empire. <clears throat> uh, so instead, I would like to talk about the Etruscans and Phoenicians uh, we, we can't help but mention the Greeks now and again because they're going to be coming in contact uh, with these peoples. But we're not going to focus on them for this week. We'll have plenty of other weeks in which we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time on Greeks. So are you ready? Let's go. Looking at the map, you know me and my maps. I like to get you oriented. This is a decent map, actually, because it's sort of telling us who the major, player, major players are during this period of time. Uh, look at the legend here. Uh, you'll see that the that uh, the yellow, yellow or orangey bits are representative of Etruscan peoples. Initially uh, inhabited this region here, later expanded to cover uh, far more of Italy, especially northern expansion. Uh, Greek peoples are active at this time. You'll, they're predominantly located in Greece, but you can see that <clears throat> Greek people will have moved in by this period of time by establishing colonies in the southern tip of, of the Italic Peninsula. And they will have established uh, multiple colonies, this time and a little bit later, uh, along the southern coast of France and uh, along the coast of Spain. The blue area represents Phoenician peoples, and you'll find them predominantly on the littoral regions, as well as uh, on the islands, tiny islands uh, throughout the Mediterranean. Uh, yeah, so let's go. Let's talk about the Etruscans. So a couple of more maps here, focusing in on uh, the Etruscan regions in the on the Italic Peninsula. Look at the left map. <clears throat> this shows us that territory and the, the area of expansion that we also just talked about in the previous map. Uh, it's quite good, I think, for highlighting those particular areas. However, I don't like it so much because it doesn't list all the places that you're going to encounter in your readings and on which I will be discussing later today in this presentation. So that's why I've inserted this map on the right, which is not as nice to look at, to be perfectly honest, not as clean, but it's got all the important places on it. So there we are. Both of those are there for you for your reference. So you're going to encounter through your readings, uh, some very uh, specific narratives in terms of events and and trends and uh, that are happening within the Etruscan prehistory and history. And I think through this course, uh, I'd like to generalize these dates a bit more because I don't want to overwhelm you with having to come up with uh, very specific dates. I, I'd much rather you know where you are relatively in time. I, I'd like you to know generally when the Bronze Age is, uh, somewhere around 3,000 to 1,000-ish 
right, BC. That's the Bronze Age. But then we generally start in the Iron Age after that. When we look a little bit closer into the Etruscan realm, <clears throat> in actuality, you know, they go through various periods that are illustrated here. And I'm going to talk about some of these periods and show you um, archaeological finds from these areas and talk about them some more. But I'm really more interested in you knowing this part at the bottom where I've entitled it Our Timeline, more general. So with respect to uh, be, uh, answering essay questions and things like that, I I'm just not expecting you to come up with 575 to 480 BC. Uh, I I'm expecting you to come up with something uh, a lot more general. Uh, uh, so anyway, I, I, I was hoping this would be useful to you. Now, let's talk about some of this stuff. In one of your readings by Mario Torelli, you were introduced to uh, reading Untired History, Men and People. I think there are two major parts of this reading that I want to kind of highlight some of the things. Part one is the land, in which he focuses on resources. Uh, key resources for the Etruscans are agricultural land, which they grow uh, crops on. Uh, particularly grain and vines and olives and flax. They have other resources uh, in the way of forests and an abundance of stone and uh, as well as uh, some really key important sources of iron. What do they do? How do they get along economically? Farming is their uh, focal point for, you know, the, the basis of their economy. But they are also uh, noted for their seafaring and uh, called by others pirates. Now, when we think of pirates, we think, oh gosh, they're, they're uh, marauding in the seas and attacking galleons, which are a completely different century and millennium, right? That's not what's happening. The truth is, is the Greeks and others tended to call pirates anybody who was engaged in sea trade. And so since the Etruscans monopolized the re regions closest to them, especially the Tyrrhenian Sea, they were uh, thought to be, you know, great seafarers who, who, who dominated. And the word for that is, is pirate. Um, so the seafaring, farming and trade, and that's part of what the seafaring was about, not only extracting resources like uh, marine life from the sea, but connecting to other places and uh, exchanging resources. By the way, this, this picture that I'm showing you here is a, a burial urn from the Villanovan period, and we call them biconical urns. I'm going to show you a lot more of them in just a minute. Um, if you notice, it, it's sort of a cone uh, uh, at the bottom part, and it's as if another cone has been turned upside down. Thus the word biconical, two cones sort of stuck together. They're often topped with a variety of things, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Uh, helmets and bowls and, and the like, but this one's sort of interesting because it also has a depiction at the very top of what we believe is, and, and I think I'll show you compelling evidence certainly, the roof line of what a Villanovan hut or house would have looked like. So part two um, of the origins of the people um, discusses the or or literally the origin. I mean, and it introduces you to the debate about what uh, the various theories of 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 the or of where these people come from. Uh, some which suggest that they come from right where they're found. Others suggest they're coming from far off places. There are myths to suggest they come up with far off places. Um, but the archaeology definitely uh, tells us that these people are coming from at least as far back as the Bronze Age populations in right here uh, where we find them. We've often, uh, Greeks, you know, included and in, uh, and, and Romans see these people as coming from uh, different places, partly because their their uh, their way of doing them things, their their culture, their 
Her language seems so distinct from um, other Latin languages. It is not uh, based on the other language groups that are present in the Italian peninsula. But that question has not been definitively answered. It may well be that they've migrated to this area prior to the Bronze Age. But we do not have any record of, of people that are infiltrating an, an indigenous culture at that time. So Villanovan culture, which more or less equates to Bronze Age culture on the Italian uh, peninsula, especially in, in the regions here on the map uh, that are colored in green. So in this period, we are starting to see larger and more stable settlements on hilltops than had been present during the Neolithic period. We see a cultural continuity, especially in the way of burial, common burial practices and common crafts. They're especially good at bronze working. It seems to be in a very important craft and they're, and they're making pottery as well. Here are some examples of Villanovan artifacts from the 9th to 8th century BC. Most of what I've shown you here are more of these biconical urns. Now, it's interesting to show, to show you that this first one and the third one are made of, of clay, a, a sort of a rough clay that we term impasto. The second one is made of bronze. I just told you that bronze and, and uh, pottery were important crafts at this time, and here's a perfect illustration. I also told you earlier that these biconical urns tend to be topped with a variety of things. The third one that I'm showing you here is the same one I showed you a couple of slides ago that has that visage of a, a hut urn, I'm sorry, uh, my, uh, a hut roof on the top. Um, whereas the first one has an upside down bowl. Often these things are covered with helmets like the one you see in the far right here, which is also made of bronze. In addition to those biconical urns, in some areas we see these, which we aptly call hut urns. If you notice the tops of these huts, these roof lines, look very much like the top of, that, of the lid of that one uh, urn that I've already shown you twice, that biconical urn. So this really helps us to imagine what Bronze Age settlements look like. We have remnants of post holes in the ground, but of course no way of reconstructing what the hut looks like or what their homes look like until, of course, we look at these. Uh, they're often covered with a variety of geometric designs, which probably had meaning of some sort that has been lost to us. Another interesting thing worth no, uh, uh, noticing is that they, they have a hole here. And we imagine that that would have symbolized the smoke hole uh, from lighting a fire inside the hut that the smoke would need to escape somewhere. And they all have these, these large doors and, and a roof line that seems to have two large wooden sort of poles that crisscross and they're presumably covered with some kind of thatch. The one on the top right here is especially interesting because of the roof line. If you look closer, not only do you have the two crisscrossing poles, it almost appears that we have like zoomorphic uh, entities posted along the top, perhaps some kind of birds. You can imagine that these, these, these posts that are crisscrossing at the top would be fantastic places for birds to perch. We also know that from uh, w what little we know of Etruscan religion and more we know of Roman religion, that, that birds were often symbolic and could be uh, interpreted as messengers uh, from the gods. It's also interesting that we're gonna, when we see later on, Etruscan temples are gonna often have uh, sculptures along the roof, the roof line, uh, the point of the roof, not so dissimilar to this idea hundreds of years later. All right, moving on from the Mil Villanovan period to the Orientalizing period, I'm focusing in on this because this period seems to be hugely important in terms of the development of Etruscan uh, culture. There's a huge amount of influences in this period. 
that uh, that change them, that that spark uh, uh, things like social differentiation, uh, that uh, increase trade, that that uh, import new ideas. We see at this time that craft specializations, the, the the emergence of craft craft specialization. Yes, we had been doing bronze working before in pottery, but we didn't have specialists that could devote their time to it. Now we do. And so we also have a in this specialization system a a division of labor. There are those that farm, there are those that that produce crafts, so there are those that uh, are in leadership roles. Populations become more centralized. Uh, centers are fortified by the end of the seventh century. So as people are, are beginning to live in more dense population areas, especially peoples like craftsmen and uh, <clears throat> elite members of society and those that serve the elite, um, we see that perhaps even farmers will have will dwell in these areas because it it appears with with the emergence of these these uh, fortification walls that uh, conflict um, is is a danger, and so you you need to build a wall to keep things in and keep things out. And uh, so it seems that we have encountered a period of conflict, perhaps uh, um, competition for resources. <clears throat> Another thing that's going on here at this period of time, which is having a profound influence and may actually be uh, affecting uh, all the change, you know, uh, hugely affecting a lot of these changes we see in the Etruscans, is the foundation of colonies. Uh, established by the uh, Greek-speaking peoples. The very first colony um, is, is in a, on a tiny little island called Ischia that's right off of the coast of southern Italy. And there is a colony established there by the name of Pithecusae. Now, there's a lot of debate over Pithecusae. It's a fantastically interesting site, to be perfectly honest. But as to whether it was an uh, exclusively a Greek colony or a, a colony that was inhabited both by Greeks and Phoenicians set up for the sole purpose, it, it, it seems, of uh, establishing an, uh, a close proximity uh, for traders to exchange with Etruscan peoples uh, without actually going onto the mainland. Soon thereafter, however, the Greek-speaking peoples start to establish colonies on the mainland, but south of the uh, region inhabited by Etruscans. It's also fascinating that at this period of time, we uh, one of the most interesting sort of uh, visual signs of, of a big cultural change are the change in, in um, burials. Where previously people had been cremated and put into those biconical urns and hut urns, now um, they are starting to be inhumed uh, in uh, cyst graves, and the wealth, the wealthy, are being buried in uh, elaborate princely tombs. What sort of influences? Um, are causing these changes from Greek and Phoenician people. I've got a list here that uh, is, probably, is not exhaustive, but worthy of, of pointing out. One of this is the introduction of writing. And we'll talk more about this probably a couple more times in this presentation. The um, introduction of writing, Etruscans did not have a writing system prior to uh, encountering Phoenician and Greek peoples. Um, the iconography, seems to change from those simple geometric patterns that they were probably very meaningful to one of painting um, uh, uh, used as it you know in fresco uh, in a fresco method uh, especially on tomb walls <clears throat> we start to see scenes on those tomb walls 
that would feel, well, almost comfortable in uh, Greek culture, like symposia or symposium in the singular. That is a, a particular Greek ritual. Uh, it's a male ritual. Uh, uh, it involves drinking and drinking games, and there's a whole set of rules behind it. But the Etruscans seem to adopt this. On the other hand, they don't seem to find value in adopting it uh, as is. In other words, the, the whole thought of excluding women from a drinking ritual to them apparently is, is not even a consideration. So in Etruscan uh, images, we see both men and women reclining uh, we see various uh, imagery within these paintings, and I'll show you examples soon that are very that are uh, show elements of the Greek symposia, but uh, again, a, ver a variety of elements also that suggest that Etruscan, Etruscans have made it their own, taken what they wanted, and uh, let the rest uh, be set aside. Some of the cult cultigents are changing at this period of time. We think that uh, certainly olives are being introduced and uh, probably grape varieties because Etruscans adopt wine drinking uh, in particular as part of this symposia and uh, they have so much fertile land that they're likely, we believe, to have started the production of grapes themselves. We also start to see much more distinct uh, differentiation between uh, various groups of people with respect to <clears throat> um, stark uh, images of, of social hierarchy. Um, those are in the tomb paintings. Those are illustrated in grave contexts. We have very rich. We have very poor. We seem to have an entire class uh, that's dependent and servile. A uh, couple of centuries later, we're going to have this class apparently uprising um, and wanting to have a greater voice in, uh, in not only politics, but in their social system. At this time as well, uh, the Etruscans are adopting not only uh, all the things listed above, but also um, specifically Greek military tactics. We see evidence on base paintings that they have um, adopted uh, a uh, tactic uh, uh, from the Greeks uh, and uh, whereby uh, hoplite soldiers uh, are, are utilized and, and mark and sort of march in group or attack in group. We also see elements of their uh, adoption of uh, Greek mythology and potentially some Phoenician mythology as well. We'll have a quick talk a little bit later about Etruscan religion, um, but it, it seems to that they have, you know, prior to encountering Greeks and Phoenicians, did not consider their own gods as being anthro, um, anthropomorphic at all. And so with the introduction of Greek culture and, you know, and Greek and the influence of Greek religion, they start to depict their own gods in an uh, anthropomorphic way. So I promise to talk a little bit more about writing. I will talk about it again a little later, but I wanted to show you an example here. On the left uh, is a, a depiction of uh, the Phoenician uh, alphabet uh, with um, also with modern uh, equivalent phonetic equivalents uh, uh, to the right so you can see in many cases it's easy to see the similarities of the letters in other cases it's a bit more difficult because they've gone through so many changes over millennia on the right here is a chart which shows in the first column here, a modern uh, phonetic value, uh, but in the next two columns, we have the Etruscan alphabet, i.e. the Etruscan version of this Greek alphabet. Um, I'm sorry, Phoenician alphabet, which may have come either straight from the Phoenicians or via the Greeks, which adopted the, the Phoenician alphabet as well. You can One thing that's particularly interesting to me in the chart on the right is the fact that uh, 
the 7th century Southern Etruscan alphabet differs from the 7th century Northern Etruscan alphabet. And so this shows a, you know, discontinuity certainly uh, between these areas and, uh, and regional uh, uh, particularities with respect to their writing systems. Showing you some images of artifacts from the from the orientalizing period, uh, Rimani knew that's basically the 8th to 7th century BC. Um, these are uh, items, especially <clears throat> these first two items are from a particular tomb at the Etruscans, uh, at a cemetery uh, connected with the Etruscan town of um, Cerveteri. And the tomb is uh, known as the Regolini Galassi tomb. And in that tomb, we see a variety of, of opulent uh, uh, grave goods, which uh, are either imported from the east, i.e. Greece or uh, Phoenicia, and, but also have imagery from these places. So uh, here's two examples. Uh, you know, we see here, this is a, a bowl that's very particular to the, the Levant and uh, on it, we have uh, horses and soldiers and uh, um, lions and 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 all scenes that would have been very important to peoples from the east, and that apparently are important to the Etruscans as well. That horse imagery is something that we're going to see um, again and again as as an important uh, animal to Etruscan peoples. Uh, on the left here, again, more lions sort of coming out of this cauldron. It's a bronze cauldron, uh, something that is very typical, especially, again, uh, in the region of the Levant. And over here on the right here is an example of a writing tablet, late 7th century, showing you the uh, Etruscan alphabet. And one of the things I, I wrote on that previous slide about the writing system, but I neglected to say out loud, was the fact that Etruscans wrote from right to left. And here's an absolute perfect example. We can certainly recognize a couple of letters here, right? A and B. And uh, then we have a D here, right? And an E. So that makes sense. So you can see how it's going from right to left. <clears throat> this is a wax tablet, by the way. I don't know if I've explained them to you already. I, I get the feeling I did, but I'll just do it real quick in case. You would fill this depressed area with with uh, uh, warm, you know, liquid wax. Let it cool. It would harden, and then you could write uh, write on it. And when you were done, you could sort of smooth it over and then start again. Here's some more examples of uh, artifacts from from the orientalizing period. <clears throat> the bottom left one also comes from the Regolini Galassi tomb, uh, just like the other two items in the previous slide. You can see that it's an extraordinary gold uh, sort of uh, pendant. It's a fibula. Fibula is a common item throughout, especially the Western Mediterranean, but certainly in the East as well. Uh, definitely with the Etruscans, it's 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 a simple pin to to pin your garment together so that your clothes don't fall off when you're using you know a, a solid sheet of of fabric and wrapping it around you to cover you. You need to sort of pin it up, and there you go. So there's one of your pins. You can see here the lion imagery as well. Another thing that's interesting here is a particular technique to create this is something that's coming from the Levant as well. So this is probably imported, either that or the craftsman himself may have come from the east. This particular figure, this, I'm sorry, this figure in the middle is sort of fascinating. Uh, it's coming from uh, the mid-6th century, just a wee bit later, but it's definitely showing us the eastern influences because we have a here we have a female statue um, uh, of an eastern goddess, and we know in part because of how she's posed and, and what she's holding. And in the far right in the 7th century, during the Orientalized peer period, we see an example of the Greek uh, uh, hoplite phalanx that I was talking about in the previous slide. So that's uh, a one of uh, um, 
right uh, 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 sorry one of the um bits of evidence we have that they've actually adopted this technique is their interest in the imagery uh, on this topic another uh, uh interesting type of imagery that we that we see and i'll show you more of these when we start to look at the tombs are imagery of banqueting scenes uh i what many scholars call symposia, other scholars refuse to call it that because of what I've already told you before, the, the insistence on Etruscans of breaking those rules. So here we have them reclining on couches just like they would in a, in an, a Greek andron, which is a special room in which symposia is performed. But the difference is we have women and men. We know they're women and men in part because of how they're dressed and the color of their skin. Yes, that's right. Just like the Minoans and Mycenaeans, certainly in this period, having received influence from Phoenicians and Greeks, they are depicting their women and men as two different colored entities. Um, when we look at this kind of imagery in the Greek world, we see various similar components, um, including when I show you the back of this, this uh, mirror, uh, dogs you know under the table and little tables um, themselves with various dishes and servants uh, here we have a servant in the middle here and a servant alongside here serving in, in these settings all right the archaic period the archaic period more or less encompasses the 6th century BC when it when with respect to talking about the Etruscans. Now, I don't want to confuse you, but I've got to say it now so that you don't later go, what? What is she talking about? When we get to really talking about the Greeks <laughs> and we say the word archaic period when we're talking about the Greeks, we are going to be talking about the 8th to 6th century BC. With the Etruscans, I know, I'm sorry, I didn't make up this terminology. With the Etruscans, when we talk to eight, the, we talk about 8th to 7th century BC, we're talking Orientalizing period. And when we get to the 6th, we call it archaic. I would be fine if you just use the words archaic period for the 8th to 6th century BC for everybody. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Understanding, of course, that in the beginning of that archaic period, the Etruscans are getting lots of outside influence. That being said, let's go on. Sixth century BC. This is a period of expansion. Remember that initial map? I should have put it again here, where we had the darker section that was the Etruscan territory, and then the lighter section that that was the the that expressed expansion. I can't change it now because we're in the middle of this, but um, go back and look at that and you can see that's where they're expanding to, especially in the Po River Valley. So they have a very strong economy during this period, a very strong elite. Uh, we think that there is a coalition among the city-states. There's no unity. There's no uh, Etruscan state per se. What you have is a, is a variety of independent city-states that recognize a common culture, which does vary the further you get from the coast, the more that culture uh, differentiates from the, from the coast, coastal cities. Um, but, you know, each Etruscan city and its hinterland is independent of the other, yet they, they seem at this point to uh, feel the need, and it makes sense when you've got so many uh, outsiders coming in to, to uh, have a sort of a, an alliance, a coalition. Um, yeah, that pretty much covers that. So now I want to show you uh, material culture, tombs, artifacts from the 6th century, as I've done with the Orientalizing period, as I've done with the Villanovan period. But before I do that, I think it's kind of important for me to give you a little bit of background on a few things so that they will make more, those bits of material culture or artifacts will make a little more sense. 
We don't know a lot about the Etruscan political system. We don't know a lot about Etruscan religion. Yes, they adopted a writing system in about the 8th century BC, but you know what? We don't have very many examples of it. And we certainly don't have anything that is like an, you know, a history of Etruria or anything like that. We have bits of this and bits of that, and, and we can more or less, you know, make out tiny bits of information, but we have nothing, no voice from them telling us about them. And that includes the realm you know, of religion. So this is, we, we piece things together by archaeological evidence, but also from uh, Romans talking about them in the past. I mean, for, you know, as a past thing. So representations of art are one of our sources, and we get those, uh, especially in the tombs, we get scenes of mythology that helps us, helps us to see how they see their cosmos. We see uh, of scenes on a uh, graved on bronze mirrors, like the one I showed you with the banqueting scene that shows us examples of, of myth and religious or ritual matters. And we have a few inscriptions here and there. We also have Roman and Greek literature, uh, some of which uh, details how Etruscan gods differed from Greek or Roman versions. Uh, that literature tells us a little bit about a council of the gods, and it also names some of the sanctuaries. We also have, as I said, very, very few literary sources from the Etruscan, uh, the, the Etruscans themselves. One of them is, well, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a clay model of a liver, and I'm going to show you that. We also have a few votive inscriptions. What I mean by votive inscriptions is that people would bring votive offerings, we call them, little statuettes or other uh, 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 statuettes of, 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 of gods and goddesses or of various things and, and present them as gifts uh, to the deities at uh, temples or sacred places. And so some of them are inscribed. They might even say like, hey, here, here, uh, God named blah, you know, I'm giving you this great thing and it's from me, Jeanette. So I promised you a liver. Here we go. That's right. This is, this is a model of a liver. This is dated from about the, the 3rd century BC. Now the Romans thought that the Etruscans were particularly good about interpreting messages from the gods. I've already mentioned before that the birds were deliverers of certain messages, and indeed that's, that is the case, and the Romans would continue to see them birds as deliverers of messages, uh, depending on how many birds and whether they come from the left or the right or whether what else is happening at the same time as the birds are flying. They'd put it all together as some sort of mi uh, mystical equation that they were to solve and understand the, uh, the, the messages from the gods. But the livers of animals were also another way for the divine entities to communicate with, with uh, humans. And so here we have kind of a map drawn out on this model of a liver, which is meant to instruct um, a, 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 a horospex, which is what they called somebody, a diviner, somebody who was able to read these messages, a horospex. We'll see some images of potentially of, of uh, horospex as well soon. Um, and so, you know, if there were, uh, I don't know, blotches or spots or something, uh, different uh, parts of the liver, then there, they, those were messages from particular gods or goddesses. And in many places, a combination of, 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 di of divine entities. So, some key points about Etruscan religion. I'll... Sorry, too many words in one slide, but this is only the one slide on this topic. Greeks and Etruscans took pains to recognize their gods and foreign ones. What I mean by that um, is, and then by the way, later Romans would, would also be uh, uh, open to that as well. 
is that they both, both Greeks and Etruscans sort of presumed that, uh, well, for starters, that their gods were the true gods. There was no sort of quandary about that. And when foreigners, uh, when they uh, encountered foreigners, uh, from different places that had different religious systems, it seemed to them that it was just, a, a, I don't know, a, a disagreement of language, perhaps. Um, there, there was this uh, assumption from the get-go that both that nobody would, you know, make make gods that aren't real. That would be in, I mean, that's just not even sensible. So since we're all presenting our gods and they're all the real gods, surely there's an equation. So when you talk about such and such a god, surely uh, because he or she or it does things that my god that I call something else does, um, surely they must be the same. Uh, that is, so that was the, basically the modus operandum for both cultures and trying to um, reconcile their own uh, beliefs uh, and cosmology with with differing beliefs uh, for other people. And as I mentioned before, Etruscan deities were not originally conceived in human form. They were spirits. They didn't necessarily certainly look like humans in any way. But you got but these Greeks that they're encountering um, and Phoenicians as well. Uh, create statues uh, that ha are effigies of their gods and goddesses. And so, again, in this effort to try and uh, reconcile these two ways of thinking of the divine and communicate with these people now that they're in regular uh, contact with, um, they start to express their, uh, their gods in a, a human form as well. When we look at the deities from the Etruscan world, it's not always clear to us about genders because again, genders was not a part, gender was not a, a, a thing that the Etruscans used to define a god. Remember, they're not anthropomorphic. They don't have genders. So sometimes we look at Etruscan gods, sometimes they appear female, other times male. And Etruscans don't have a problem with this. They really didn't see this one is right and one is wrong. Uh, it was just two, you know, anthropomorphic ways of, of depicting a deity. Um, in the end, uh, the, the systems, the Greek and Etruscan systems, don't match up perfectly. In fact, they don't match up terribly well at all, <laughs> like, I've got to tell you. Um, Etruscan's uh, system seems much more complicated and overlapping and circular and cyclical and whereas the Greek system seems to just you know uh, how should I say seems to, to seems to compartmentalize each deity and their duties and their their place and their position in a way like they want to compartmentalize perhaps their own society with the notion that everyone has a place there's a specific hierarchy um, Everyone has their duties and they're separate from someone else's. There's a perhaps a system of checks and balances. You don't really get that so much in the Etruscan system. So the, uh, their attempts to reconcile don't always work terribly well. Um, yeah, the only other thing I would mention here is the last one, that the Etruscan gods and the groups of gods, because they do have groups and they're not excluded necessarily from the other groups right so there's again overlapping and circular and it's 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 all intertwined but yet it's grouped as well the they do they all have fixed positions in the sky so uh that uh, that perhaps is something common with other religions is the notion that the gods the divine actually lives up in in the sky in specific places the Etruscans also have demons as part of their religion. And these uh, demons are, are numerous. They're male, they're female. In fact, quite honestly, there's only sort of a gradual difference between the gods and the demons. They're all coming from the same place. 
and uh, they're 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 not like the Greek system compartmentalized. We don't have well a god is someone that has these characteristics, whereas a demon has these. Well, no, they're all kind of the similar, but maybe to different with a different emphasis and a different degree and there's and the gray areas in between are all filled in i know it's a little confusing one of the things that we notice when we see them depicted in art is that often demons are depicted as part animal we see that we might see them with a wolf uh, uh human a wolf head um, often a wolf human demon is one that's associated with death uh, might have a, a sea monster or a dolphin human uh, demon, which would be a, a demon of the sea. There's various other kind of animals as well. So you know, if you're looking at Etruscan art and you see something with a something anthropomorphic with a uh, an animal head, you're usually talking about uh, a demon. Many death demons um, have huge front-facing eyes. It's interesting that in, in Greek art, uh, this front, front facing entities are, are rare as well. And they're very confrontational and uncomfortable. Uh, that front facing, uh, uh, the top uh, illustration here, uh, the, the relief sculpture shows an Etruscan demon in the middle. In this case, this demon is, is anthropomorphic, but, he, uh, but uh, as is frequently the case, um, it's winged and uh, so no this is not an angelic figure this is this is a demon figure and the bottom right as well you see another winged fig figure which is the 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 demon god slash goddess depending how it's depicted um, of uh, vamp another winged creature so showing you uh, a tomb painting that uh, depicts uh, the, the, the little vignettes I showed you of two of those demons in the previous slide. Uh, Vanth, here we have an entire picture of uh, Vanth with, with his, her wings. And also the demon Karen. Karen, which is also an entity from, from uh, Greek mythology. Karen here is blue which makes it very clear that Karen is, uh, is not, is, is of another world. So in this particular picture, this is a narrative that's actually uh, talking about a Greek myth. And it's uh, human sacrifice offered by Achilles from the Homeric tale, the Iliad, um, at uh, the funeral uh, of his uh, dear uh, departed friend Patroclus. Uh, so we see these these uh, Trojan prisoners. Uh, we know they're prisoners because they're naked, um, coming in and having been sacrificed. So yes, human sacrifice to the ghost of Patroclus. Etruscans uh, practice their religion. Uh, through rituals, we know that much. And we know that altars are extremely important and they're the very center of, of a sacrificial action. Early altars were mounds of earth um, and they're gradually replaced over time by piles of stones. And then as we go on through time by actual sort of uh, shaped, uh, uh, bricks uh, or, or blocks of stone uh, until we see things that are very purposely built like we have in the bottom right here. Uh, very purposely built altar. Uh, on the top here is another example of the remnants of an Etruscan altar. So when do you uh, do that or why do you, you engage in these rituals? Um, well, you do so to appease the deities, uh, gods and goddesses. Um, you might attribute a specific altar or shrine to a specific god or goddess. Um, you would uh, engage in ritual to sanctify a building or uh, like the, the, the 
the the beginning of construction constructing a building that uh, you will have the the blessing of the gods to erect it or the settlement erect the settlement or to erect a ritual area uh, what kinds of rituals well you might offer uh, grain and wine animal sacrifices is the most common type of ritual and occasionally we see uh, evidence of human sacrifice under uh, uh, ritual areas or, or uh, important, you know, temples and, and buildings. You also might engage in ritual in funerary contexts. We have certain evidence that suggests that they, they uh, engaged in uh, banqueting and, and maybe even funeral games and, and uh, processions and the like with funerals. Um, these things help us uh, help individuals uh, gain entrance to the next life uh, and uh, reinvigorate those spirits that have, that have passed on, giving them strength uh, on their journey. The kinds of sacrificial offerings are just uh, basically to get more precise, uh, based on what I just said. Um, the uh, non-bloody going down to the bottom here, which would include, uh, you know, grains, cereals, wine, milk, um, the sorts of uh, foods and drinks that you might appreciate, the gods will as well. But flesh and organs of animals are particularly important. And we think that the species is chosen um, based on, well, two things. I have omitted one here. Um, is that the the type of ritual event and the specific which I have here the specific God that is being uh, communicated uh, with there were uh, specific kinds of animals that were chosen um, as I uh, we have evidence in uh, through excavation of ritual contexts of tortoises fish mollusks birds foxes badgers cattle, pigs, sheep, and goats, super common. Probably one of the most common. Oh, I have it down here. Most proliferate sheep, goats, and pigs. That's right. Uh, deer, dogs, horses, but the most precious of all was the ox. The reason the ox is, I know I can't stop. The reason the ox is, is, is especially precious is because the ox is, some, is a work animal. It's something that's required to pull a plow and to engage in agriculture. So the loss of an ox is indeed the loss of a precious item. Whereas the loss of one more sheep or goat is not a big deal. You know, your, your, you will make more, you know, lambs in the spring, <clears throat> but an ox is, is quite the sacrifice. We can't not, we can't talk about Etruscan religion and rituals and not talk about uh, temples. The Etruscans did not make temples in Villanovan periods or <clears throat> even uh, in uh, uh, orientalizing periods, but they certainly did by the time of the archaic period. Uh, they are being influenced heavily by, again, I keep saying this, Greek and Etruscan peoples. And at first glance, one sees columns and goes, ah, well, they're doing it just like Greek temples. But they aren't. Like symposia, they are taking what they want from it and creating something completely new and their own. So here's a, a few examples of models of Etruscan uh, temples. Um, here's a, a little small little model that we found uh, at the Etruscan uh, site of Volci. And here is a, a model of an Etruscan temple that was in, constructed in the 19th century. And then here's a, a life-size model built in London based on directions of Roman architect Vitruvius. Now Vitruvius lived, you know, way past the time of the Etruscans, but um, he as one of our few sources other than two uh, remnants of two Etruscan temples that I'm about to show you. Um, he's one of, uh, he's our only written source as to the architecture of, of a typical Etruscan temple. <clears throat> Much of what he says corresponds with our two 
archaeological remnants, which we're about to look at. Um, so what are those characteristics? Well, according to Vitruvius, it has a square plan. <clears throat> and it has columns only at the front. And this and a plain back wall. Now that is very different than a Greek temple. It has a one to three part kella. Kella is a uh, kella in the singular, kelli in the plural, is a Latin term which uh, refers to these rooms at the back. So often we have three kelli, <clears throat> occasionally just one in for Etruscan temples. All this is built on a base, a podium. Greek temples don't have that with steps going up to it. And in Etruscan temples, in this pediment region, right, there's no tympanum. Do you see? It's just, there. It's, it's vacant in this space. And that is very different than Greek temples. So again, they've taken things they like. The columns, whether they're coming from the Greeks or not, columns, the inventor of columns were the Egyptians. Greeks got it from the Egyptians, potentially even via peoples from the Near East, like the Phoenicians. <clears throat> and then, so they heavily utilized columns. Uh, we know that the, the, that the Minoans utilized columns, Mycenaeans utilized columns. Um, and so here we have the Etruscan and the, their uh, use of columns. <clears throat> So here's those two temples that we do have remnants of. This one at, Pier, uh, at the side of Pyrgi. And we can see how it matches uh, that description. It's square. There is a, a solid back wall. We have columns only at the front. Uh, we have no tympanum in the pediment. <coughs> here's a side view of the one at Vey. Uh, columns only at the front, plain back wall on a podium, right? Is, uh, so this one's on a podium as well. Um, and I would also note that at the top here are various uh, statuettes. There's a term we use uh, in archaeology for those. It's acroteri. Yes, another Greek word. I'm so sorry. Another Greek word, acroteri. And if I would just you know, spark your memory that back in the Villanovan age, we were looking at those hut urns. And remember, we were looking and seeing birds and things on top of those huts. And I told you that later on, we'd start to see little statuettes and things along the ridges of buildings. And I think that there's, you know, this is a something, a vestige of an, a much earlier time. We don't have this kind of thing happening in Greek temples but the Etruscans do it. And I think it is something that's, that's a key part of, you know, Etruscan culture that has been there for hundreds of years. Now, let's talk a little bit about Etruscan death and burial. That's especially important because a lot of the evidence I'm going to show you from the sixth century is burial evidence and tomb evidence. Etruscans uh, uh, buried their dead in the sixth century certainly in three uh, different types of uh, receptacles. Sarcophagi. So not just the 6th century, I'm talking 6th century and later, because quite honestly, the sarcophagi that I'm showing you an example of here, these date to about the 2nd century BC. Um, a, a select elite were buried in princely tombs. This image I have of... Uh, the mus these musicians are from one of those princely tombs, and we'll be taking a closer look at some of those. And also in the later, circa, certainly by the third and second century BC, they are sometimes using cremation again and burying them in cinerary urns that are not like those Villanovan ones at all. Because remember, we've passed in time quite a bit here. We haven't used a Villanovan one, those biconical urns since the ninth century BC. And certainly by the third, second, first century BC, we're back to using some, uh, uh, doing some cremations and, and, and burying them in a whole new type, type of cinerary urn, which I think is pretty obvious if you compare these to the sarcophagi, um, really, what it is, is the cinerary urns try to uh, mimic the sarcophagi. Uh, it, they just don't need as much space for the ashes. 
So you often get this very truncated body. Looking at some of these sarcophagi, this is perhaps one of the most famous and the most beautiful, I would suggest, sarcophagus of the 6th century BC. It shows, uh, it depicts uh, a man and a woman, we call it sarcophagus of a married couple. Uh, these man and woman are reclining on a couch, perhaps engaged in uh, this uh, celebratory ritual that we often see in uh, uh, depicted in uh, Etruscan iconography, the one that's very like symposium. Um, they were holding things. We imagine by looking at uh, paintings and other sarcophagi that what they're probably holding, he in his right hand is probably holding an egg. Not exactly sure what that represents. Probably has something to do with the notion of rebirth. She may well be holding some kind of goblet or patera, which is a sort of little plate that we'll see over and over again uh, that is used for making offerings to the gods. I love this. And we're going to look at some close-ups in the next slide because of the detail. If you look at the back of them, you know, the, the, the way uh, the, the carving of the drapery um, and the articulation of, of the hair curls or braids, uh, definitely with her we're talking, it appears to be braids, or is it dreadlocks? Not entirely sure there. Um, it's also interesting that one of them is barefoot, him, he is barefoot, and she, however, uh, is wearing a sort of sandal. Here's some close-ups, as I said. You can see that they were both holding something <clears throat> that's now missing. And it's, it's, it's lovely. They're relaxed. They're a loving couple. They're, they're happy. Is this meant to signify the happiness that they felt in life? Or is this an eternal happiness or a happiness that they hope in the next life? I mean, that's a really, it's an important, important question, especially when we're about to look at all these tomb paintings. Um, when we're trying to figure out what it is that they're actually trying to depict. There's a few more examples of later sarcophagi. Uh, second, uh, this one's as old as the fourth century. This one's lovely as well. Potentially another married couple reclining on a couch. They are not engaged in a symposia, but a loving embrace. Um, then we have uh, th this one, uh, but this is on a cinerary urn, which is why you have these truncated bodies. So potentially you have this couple married together. Um, and this is, this is one that I've already showed you. And here's a one uh, of, a, of a woman. And you can see this one, there's lots and lots of evidence of the paint still remains. You can see how colorful it was. A few more later ones. Again, you don't need as much room when it's cinerary urns, right? Not sarcophagi, but you can just kind of have them all bend their legs and squish up somehow so that you don't need quite so much space, but still trying to depict a similar sort of pose as they would have on a sarcophagus. I mentioned before that they're often holding these patera. Do you see here this special sort of plate bowl thing? He's got a patera. He's got a patera. This individual has a patera. And it's to show their piety, perhaps, bringing, you know, uh, gifts to the gods and, and the other life. So about those princely tombs for that uh, small percentage of a elite population, they come in a variety of designs. And I show you this to show you the kind of variety they come in. Some are larger than others. Some are relatively small. And some are incredibly elaborate. Um, so this hopefully uh, shows uh, uh, that, that to you. Um, all of them have in front of them, and I'll just actually go back here, this particular area. Do you see how that's one of the things that they all have in common? 
common is this sort of front passageway that is an entrance to the tomb, and that we call a dromos. And here are two examples um, of dromoi, which would be the plural of dromos. Again, another Greek word. I'm so sorry. Another interesting thing about Etruscan tombs is when compared to the foundations of Etruscan houses, they appear to be similar. <clears throat> so if you would remove the dramas, which is that pathway to the tomb that I just showed you, you get something that is not so dissimilar right, to an Etruscan house. So in that way, we wonder, is the tomb perhaps meant to be the home um, of, of the body of that individual in the afterlife? So I'm going to show you some tombs. And the first set of tombs I'm going to show you are predominantly from the 6th century from the city of Tarquinia. And there is Tarquinia on your map. And here's a couple examples of uh, two different cemeteries or, or necropoli, uh, necropolis at uh, Tarquinia. First is uh, the uh, tomb that's been labeled the tomb of the Olympic Games. We don't know if they're Olympic Games, but the excavator got to name it. And that's what he or she named it. So here's, it's not a good picture, but I wanted to give you sort of a broad overview of what the primary room uh, looks like here. And then uh, giving you some uh, examples. Now this is one down here in the bottom right. This is a reconstruction, because you can see here in the room that clearly all that is not filled in. But based on remnants uh, of, of the wall painting, uh, they have artistically reconstructed uh, this, so it's helpful for looking. So it's it, this, we think, is an athlete with a discus, which is definitely some uh, an activity engaged in at the Greek Olympic Games. Um, this, uh, these individuals, so where do I begin? So up here, right, that's meant to be this uh, wall right here. Uh, so this is a reconstruction of, of this. So this this individual uh, here with the funny hat uh, seems to be female, partly because of the color of the skin, but is but is wearing an interesting hat and may uh, or may not have uh, some kind of role to play with respect to uh, religion and ritual. Um, the rest of the individuals are brown, as you can tell. Uh, some bearded, some not bearded, and all seem to be engaging in perhaps running or some other uh, kind of athletic activity. Another tomb we have of Tarquinia has been named the Tomb of the Leopards. It's not really too hard to figure out what these tomb names are. So you can see here in the very top uh, parts of the wall are uh, two leopards facing one another. But below them is, is one of those scenes that uh, Grecophile scholars have labeled symposium, uh, which is probably better referred to as Etruscan banqueting. So I think I'm going to try and call it just Etruscan banqueting in the future. So d during these Etruscan banquets, as is evident here, we have both men and women participating. You can tell by the different colors of their skin. They are attended to by naked, servile individuals, uh, showing their lower status. These individuals are smaller and they're naked and uh, carrying the pitcher here. So their, their role is to serve these people. Um, we often see these garlands. Uh, we'll see them in other uh, images perhaps more clearly. Uh, we think that they perhaps represent uh, fertility. So uh, perhaps again uh, something uh, to do uh, with rebirth like the egg. The ceilings are often decorated and uh, 
patterns such as this, these check marks may uh, ref, uh, infer uh, a textile and refer to potentially a burial shroud for the individual or individuals uh, buried here. Um, on one of the side walls is this picture of musicians, which I kind of uh, showed you before. And we uh, certainly see two different kinds of instruments, this sort of double flute and this uh, lyre or kithara. And we have this individual here that's holding a cup. And the type of cup he's holding is called a kylix, which is a particularly Greek form, a Greek form that is used for the Greek ritual of symposia and which is again a, a reference to that but so uh it's it's that may be so he's probably drinking wine and he may well be simultaneously dancing to the music so what is this so everyone's having a party so we're banqueting we're being served by slaves oh we're hanging out with um, you know our husbands and wives and we got music and we've got dancing so is this de a depiction of the other world? Is this what it's like after death? Is it all fun and music and dancing? Is it a depiction of the uh, funerary banquet and ritual that goes at the time of burial? Is it a perpetuation of that, that, that ritual that's supposed to help invigorate the spirit in the afterlife and get him or her through to the next life perhaps depicting it on the walls is a way of perpetuating that and con and giving that uh, um perpetually invigorating the spirit right without you having a, a perpetual party on the outside so which is one of the reasons i call these perpetual parties that, that may well be the case or or some scholars have suggested that this is a representation of their life this is how, this is the, these are the things they enjoyed in life. They, they enjoyed their least status. They enjoyed their parties. They enjoyed music. They enjoyed dancing. Uh, and this is how the things that they, um, how people want to remember them, perhaps. Uh, or things that they would have wanted to remember themselves. Here's another tomb. They call this tomb tomb of the augurs uh particularly after this individual um and i had actually written the word augur on a previous slide but i didn't say it out loud when i was talking about etruscan religion religion i was talking about the haruspex uh the person who would uh be uh, a diviner uh who person who might read liver uh, livers um, and the, the, there was another uh, word on that same page uh, of auger. So an auger is someone who reads the flights of birds. We've already talked about how birds are important in communication to the gods. This individual in the bottom left here with the staff, uh, which we call a litus, um, is, we think, interpreting the, the flight of these birds. This person who is doing a, a dance may or may not be a haruspex, perhaps engaged in some kind of ritual dance. Not entirely sure about that. Um, so, or he may be another augur, which is why the, but you know, he seems to have a very specific and distinct headdress that's different than that of the guy with the staff um, with his hand pointing to the birds. On the other hand, things get weird. That's right. Let's just point at the elephant in the room here with the bottom middle picture, who is, by the way, wearing the same kind of distinctive hat as this guy in the right. Another thing worth noticing about this guy with the hat at the bottom here is if he may be wearing a mask. Can you see the line here and then the delineation between the color of the skin on his neck and the color of skin on the face? I haven't even talked about what he's doing yet yet, but so just looking at him, he's wearing the funny mask, right? He's wearing some outfit with some particular design, what I would imagine has meaning. It's not just happens to be a weave. Are those birds? I don't know. What is, I mean, so is that, 
I think that as an Etruscan, I would be expected to understand what his hat means, what his mask means, what that particular outfit means. But the truth is I'm not Etruscan, so I don't know, but I know it's, it's obviously referring to something. So now let's just talk about the weirdest part ever, right? He's clearly holding onto some kind of rope, let's say. Leather thong, who knows? Lead, leash, I don't know. And if you follow it, it's wrapped around the, the leg of this individual who's all caught up in it. And then it goes around and around, wrapped around his arm, right? And then wrapped around his head, which has a bag over it, right? And eventually leads to the collar of this dog who is ravagely, he's ravaging, you know, and, and attacking this um, individual that is wearing nothing more than a thong and with his head covered, but who seems to have something to protect himself, a club. What does this mean? I don't know. I just don't know. So your guess is as good as mine. Is this some kind of funerary ritual? And the reason we ask that is because of this left picture where we have an image of two naked men, one bearded, one not bearded, which in if it was Greek would suggest that one the not bearded one is younger than the bearded one who would be older. But these two men that are naked are probably engaging in, in uh, a Greek Olympic sort of a ritual of wrestling. So they're probably wrestling and we're, we think wrestling uh, to win the, the prize, which would be these, you know, silver or bronze uh, uh, bowls that would be very expensive and given away as kind of like a trophy. So mm, is it funerary games? We think that they're, they may be holding as a part of that, you know, last banquet to bury the dead, perhaps holding some kind of funerary game. And is this gruesome, you know, uh, spectacle part of that? Can't tell you. Something here seems to be connecting the divine who are sending message with the realm of humanity and potentially we have a sacrificial situation here? Not really sure. One other thing I want to point out, because I just can't keep going on and on and on here, is this particular uh, uh, image in the middle uh, on the back wall of the main room. Uh, and <sighs> I could go on and on and I just I know that this is going to be another long video as it is so I'm going to try and keep it as short as possible and because this is not a whole course about the the Etruscans but this wall um, and then the painting on it seems to illustrate a door a doorway to where we think perhaps to the other side to the other realm to the realm of the dead what and and then we have two individuals on each side here posing in a specific pose that certainly would be understood by a Etruscan audience um that uh you know yeah so through we imagine that the spirit of the dead would go through that doorway um and that all these things perhaps again are invigorating that spirit or helping with that transition representing the funerary procedures representing the thing this person liked best in life i don't right not really sure so i'm going to have to start making these briefer because i'm just taking way too long another tomb tomb of the bulls so interesting but i'm going to try and keep it short um, in the central panel here you can see we have burial chambers beyond it but in the main room of the tomb um, yeah, the ceiling has minimal decoration, um, but this central panel, I have a close-up here on the right. Uh, we have this individual that seems to be hiding behind this thing that's uh, got uh, statues or real reposing uh, animals. We think that, quite honestly, this thing was added uh, after the original painting, uh, and so it's a little confusing to us. Um, this uh, individual is uh, on 
his way um, and uh, doesn't realize that there is an individual laying in wait uh, ready to, to kill him. Uh, in short, we think uh, that this depicts a, a scene uh, out of mythology where by uh, this uh, entity back here is the warrior of Achilles from from Homeric poetry, especially the Iliad, and he's lying in wait for Troilus, who is coming, not unbeknownst to him, along. And see, the thing is, Troilus has supposedly in myth uh, rebuked Achilles' affections, and Achilles says, "If I can't have you, nobody can," and he waits to kill him for turning him refusing his love yes that's right oh gosh so let's go back i'm sorry i'm just going to go back to the previous slide looking over the doorways here we're taking a closer closer look um, at these images um but first let's just take a super quick look at the very top here right more imagery fantastic uh, winged animals on the one side and then the other side uh, perhaps uh, you know something of the earthly realm with with uh, uh, horses uh, you know and, and a rider um, does this does the juxtaposition of this potentially earthly realm and uh, other earthly, uh, you know, super earthly realm. Uh, does it also reflect what we're going to see in this next panel? I don't really know. If it does, if it does, then this is the earthly realm whereby males penetrate other males um, while bulls with erect penises <coughs> charge at them with a lot of easternized sort of iconography included. But in the other earthly realm, bulls are, are uh, calm and lie and take no notice of males penetrating females who are actually held up on the back so that they can be the right height, of course, of another male. So I guess that's how friends help friends in the other realm. Anyway, leaving that alone, you, I, I, I've got to go on, sorry. Tomb of the Baron. Again, more of these, these garlands that we think uh, represent fertility. We have otherworldly animals up here. Um, and a uh, scene, we think that this individual in the middle is a goddess. Again, we have these hor our horsey Etruscans. Uh, interesting that this one is, is clothed at the, on the goddess side. Um, this one is not clothed on the side of this man and this child. The child is playing the double flute. The man is making an offering of wine in a Greek kylix to what we think is a goddess. What does it mean? Tomb of hunting and fishing. Uh, at the top here, we have a scene where we have a couple reposing. There's a, 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 a young person playing the double flute. We think these are the daughters just kind of hanging out and sitting at the foot of the bed, making garlands of fertility. Here we have some slaves that are serving. This couple is, is perpetually having, you know, a lovely uh, time. And below them on the wall here is this scene of fish and birds. There are people in a boat. There's a guy with a sling trying to take down some birds. Does this represent the other world? Does this represent what this indiv these individuals or him perhaps or her or whatever that they like to do in life? And I don't know. Here's a close up. So right, here's the guy with the sling trying to take down the birds. Here's a close up of the people fishing. The, clearly there's a fish, he's got a line. He's dropping into the water. But also there's a scene where by the top of this hill, which by the way, doesn't look too dissimilar in some ways to that Minoan stuff, does it? With all the bright colors and the wavy lines, but I'll leave that alone. Um, going to the top of the hill, what's happening? So he's diving, 
He's got his arms out. He seems to actually be intentionally diving. Is this a lovely day of swimming in the river and diving off? Or has this guy just been pushed? Because what is up with this? Or is this an over-exaggerated climbing motion? We are uh, not sure. Is this how he died? Was he pushed off a cliff while he was out hunting? I don't know. Tomb of the lioness. Exactly. This is why I have to go so fast. Two of the lionesses. Here we have lionesses up here. Not leopards this time. Lionesses. Checkered board roof, right? Perhaps representing the burial shroud. We have a giant uh, vessel. This is a particular type of Greek vessel called a crater. It's used to mix wine and water. Well, at least that's what the Greeks sort of used it for. Because at their symposia, they mixed wine and water. And it was, uh, you know, diluted uh, quite a lot. The Etruscans, however, saw no point in that. And I love these Etruscans. They're like, why would I mix water with it? It's so good. And it just makes me have fun. So there they go. So they, you know, on the other hand, and, and so the, the Greeks thought they were very, very gauche, drinking that wine straight, having women at their parties. And oh my gosh. Not that the Greeks would never have women. Of course, the odd prostitute was all right. Anyway, but not respectable women. So here we are. What's going on? So we have this big crater. Is this representative of some sort of wine feast? Is this kind of a, a prize? Is it representative of a um, offering to the gods, to the dead? Don't know. What's everyone else doing? Well, we have a female person here. Da you know perhaps engaged in some kind of dance. We definitely have what appears to be a dance over here. Um, although this is, guy's got a pitcher. Does he need to like drink straight from the pitcher while he's dancing? Or is this the help? He is naked after all, and he is carrying a pitcher. You know, is this the help? Uh, you know, these slaves, you know, enjoy, or, you know, enjoying the risk of us, uh, enjoying some kind of party in the back. I don't know. We do have more fish here, like the, the tomb of hunting and fishing. Not really sure what's going on. What is this vessel in the corner that's just left there? What does that mean? It was important enough to paint into the picture. It has meaning. Not really sure what. From the same tomb, we have a picture of this reclining individual. You can see him over here on the side uh, left wall. Uh, perhaps we think this also, again, has uh, is a reference to fertility. Uh, you can see a bit of that shroud on the ceiling. Um, you can see that like that sarcophagus of the married couple, he has sort of these long dreads. Ah, let's go back. He's got these long dreads or whatever you want to call them. And he's holding what I think the man in the, uh, on the, in the sarcophagus of the married couple should be holding that's now missing an egg. And like I said, that egg is probably a representation of, uh, like renewal or, uh, rebirth. A new tomb, tomb of the triclinium. Triclinium is a Roman word and it basically is like means dining room. Uh, so here we have a fifth century tomb. You can see in the back wall that that's that, that there's more dining and banqueting going on with with uh, male and female individuals, lots more of these garlands and hanging about. Uh, animals underneath the tables, just like I pointed out earlier in the banqueting scene. Here's somebody playing a flute. Looking on the sidewall here, especially in the close-up, we see another musician playing a kithra or a lyre, and he is a male individual. Uh, but this female entity is, is seems to be dancing to the music and enjoying, and they, they're in some outdoor setting or some paradise-type place not really sure and at the bottom is a male and female engaged uh, in dance as well uh, they I mean I don't think they could be anything but dancing but they, they seem to all be having a good time and I could go on and on and ask you the same questions as to why but I will spare you Whew. 
I am going to show you a few more tombs, sorry. Although, maybe I shouldn't be sorry because they're so cool, aren't they? So, by the time we get to the 5th century, the Etruscan culture is experiencing a period, began to experience a period of crisis. Um, the Etruscans lose control of part of their territory, uh, specifically Rome and Latium, which is the region in which Rome is located, it, because Reem, Reem, Rome now controls Latium. They uh, get into battles with the Greeks, who have settled just to the south of them in colonies. Uh, it's a sea battle, and uh, it the, the Greeks are victorious, and this sort of d diminishes Etruscan sea power. There are struggles throughout the Italian peninsula with other peoples, uh, and the Etruscan and other peoples, and the Romans. It's a time of, of, of conflict. We see Greek imports decline at this time. So they are not, you know, perhaps, again, as a result of, of these battles they're having with, with the Greeks, uh, the sea battle, certainly, there's a general, uh, perhaps, distaste for Greek items or disconnection or di discommunication. Um, but it also may reflect a time of economic uh, uh, challenges as well. We see internal struggles at this time, uprisings of lower classes, these this servitude class that had emerged, certainly, uh, in the uh, Orientalized period that was well grounded by the 6th century is uprising and requiring uh, a greater role in their society and political system. So we definitely start to see a decline in the economy as a result from, from conflicts with Greeks, conflicts on the, the peninsula, and conflicts internally. Uh, those are manifested in the grave goods. The cemeteries in general are much poorer when we do see elaborate tombs, uh, there the craftsmanship is much poorer. By the end of the fifth century, there is a, a brief uh, period of economic uh, recovery that's accompanied by a new political system, which is another hint to those internal struggles that were happening before. Now we have an oligarchy. We no longer have a system, which probably existed in the sixth century, of kings, of monarchies. Now we have much greater representation. It's more or less an elite representation still with an oligarchy, but it's not a single individual. So things are changing. Fourth to first century, um, just kind of smushing this all together. There is a lot of back and forth and in and out and off and on and general decline. We have continued conflicts with Rome and Etruria and various Etruscan cities. Because remember, they're not united. So Rome is picking them off one at a time, basically. We see a gradual decline of Etruscan power throughout Etruria and a gradual dominance of Rome in the area. We have decades upon decades upon decades of conflict. Numerous conflicts throughout the peninsula, in fact, as Roman expands and takes over other indigenous groups throughout the, the uh, entire peninsula. They begin this process by overcoming Samnites, but then they just start picking off the rest of their neighbors uh, one at a time. Rome starts to become uh, quite the power in the Italian peninsula and starts to, to vie with, uh, how should I say, run butt heads with other groups. But if you look uh, at this, Rome at the same time, and we'll talk about this perhaps more later with Rome, but Rome has been developing certainly since the fifth century uh, and or even as early as the sixth, they, uh, a, a general culture uh, a military uh, of warfare. A military culture, that one that needs almost that uh, the um, the equation of 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 a good man is one who is successful in war, and uh, a strong people is one uh, that is successful in war and dominates their neighbors, and it's it's it develops into a culture that you know that uh, that simply can't stop. And so eventually they butt heads with outsiders like the Carthaginians. Uh, certainly that will happen um, in areas like Sicily 
uh, where uh, the Carthaginians, who have been growing in power uh, all this time, uh, Carthage, you know, we'll talk more about this later, but Carthage is a site in Northern Africa, um, which had been established in about the ninth century BC uh, by Phoenicians. And since they had, you know, sort of politically and socially in many ways disconnected from the motherland and, and by the sixth century have become a power in the Western Mediterranean to, uh, with lots, uh, not just in Northern Africa, but it, especially in places like uh, Spain and, uh, and islands in between. Anyway, so, uh, you know, uh, Rome uh, comes into conflict with people like the Carth Carthaginians. Uh, Rome also is experiencing conflicts within uh, uh, this its own territory, um, and uh, whereas uh, and as well as as those uh, outside of its territory, including various Etruscan cities. This continues until. Uh, Quite honestly, the first century, I, I've hear the fourth century to the first century BC, but the truth is it continues until the first century uh, uh, AD, until we get uh, uh, what, uh, you know, the Emperor um, Augustus, aka Octavian, um, called uh, the, the Pax Romana, the, Romana the, the, basically the Roman peace and uh, in which they, the fighting uh, uh, and civil wars that have been happening and, and wars with, uh, throughout the Italian peninsula come to a halt. Now wars can still continue, don't get me wrong, in far flung places, but um, there seems to be, it takes until then before peace uh, is part of uh, life at Rome itself. So looking at some Etruscan uh, evidence during this particular period, we're going to turn to Vulci, the site of Vulci, which I've shown here on the map, um, and look at the uh, Francois tomb, which dates from the fourth to third century BC. So this particular part here, this entryway, also this long bit here, right? Can anyone tell me? I can't hear you. What's that called? Oh yeah, a dramos. Thank you, dramos. And here we are inside the Francois tomb. It's interesting that we start to see a different approach to tomb decoration. In the past, we had the ceiling painted with that sort of checkerboard shroud frequently. Now we have something that's sculpted. So it, it appears to be sculpted sort of roof beams. Uh, uh, they're supposed to appear to be like roof beams. And we also have this doorway type area. It's more like a, a keyhole. We see that the outside of some tombs too. Again, I would suggest a representation of, of a transition from one world to the other. Uh, in this particular area, we see the remnants of a, a, an individual uh, at the bottom here, perhaps the deceased going through. Uh, this picture on the right also shows evidence of, of the sculpting. Perhaps in an actual Etruscan home, this would have been the smoke hole. And this would, perhaps this gives us insight into the decoration of Etruscan home in the 4th and 3rd century BC. We can also see remnants of paint everywhere on the ceiling. So this is the tomb that we uh, had this particular picture that I've already showed you when we were talking about Roman religion and ritual and sacrifice. Uh, so I don't need to go through this this whole uh, picture again about the sacrifice of the Trojan soldiers uh, f uh, during the funeral of Patroclus or the demons. But I will point out this individual, which we who we think may uh, have been the deceased in this tomb, Vel Satis is the Etruscan man. It's interesting to see that his his robe is decorated with uh, various nude figures and that he is depicted with his slave. 
and it says who he is. Uh, and we also know by his, his, where he's wearing his slave, Arnza. That's his name written right there. And Arnza seems to be a gentle creature holding a bird. But then again, we can't forget that birds are messengers of the gods. So is the bird going to lead the deceased to the other realm? We certainly see what might be a doorway here. And what has Arnza got to do with this? Is Arnza dead too? Is he in the tomb? Were they special friends in life? I mean, was he more than just a slave? I'm not really sure. Showing you uh, some tombs from this period from the side of Cairo or uh, Cherveteri is, a, is uh, another name for this particular site. Really interesting site with, with it's got a lot of these dome shaped tombs. It's also got these type of, of rock wall tombs as well. One of my favorite tombs, I have to confess. Um, and uh, as we saw in the Francois tomb, this this break from painting to one of relief sculpture uh, for decoration, uh, Tomb of the Reliefs gives us the epitome of that, of sculpture decoration in a tomb context. You can study this for, for uh, long periods of time just to see all the details of things. And, and, and then, then I want you to ask your question. Uh, the question to yourself is why? Why does somebody need rope on their tomb, on a wall, as if it's rope in a wall? Or, or uh, the uh, axes or... or, or uh, the, these appear to be tools, uh, not, you know, items of warfare. Uh, perhaps it, it connects with the notion of a tomb as a home and a resting place for the next life. Perhaps the deceased is meant to go through a doorway to the other world, but to come back here. Maybe he, is, he or she is constantly sort of drawn back into the realm of the living, into their resting place. I don't know. Um, we're going to find shields and helmets and things on the wall, all sorts of things. Um, another thing I like about these tombs is often where the bodies are placed. They're, they have sculpted pillows. So, yeah, Tomb of the Reliefs. Uh, you, is that a, a, yeah, a dog that's very happy to greet you when you come home, perhaps? Here's a... Uh, a uh, three-headed dog and if anyone is uh, if there's any mythology buffs out there then you'll know that a three-headed dog is 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 uh, an animal of Greek mythology that guards the gates to the netherworld so hmm, yeah there's so the references to life references to the afterlife perhaps this is a shield uh, sword in a scabbard, helmet, so elements of warfare, a fan. Yeah, I suppose you could get too hot. Uh, this is uh, another little creature. This, I think, may be a boar here. Um, vessels and, yeah, hmm, sorry. Yeah, extraordinary. Um, uh, imagine these, these are supposed to be columns, right? Architectural features here. These are the tops of columns. These are volutes, is what these swirly bits are at the top. Okay. I think we'll take a breather and a rest here and, uh, and start up uh, again. Uh, everyone get up, calisthenics, jump up and down, wiggle your toes, that sort of thing. And uh, we'll. We'll start again with the Phoenicians. Now, I promise you, we're well over halfway through because I'm not going to spend nearly as much time on the Phoenicians. Is it because I don't like them? No, I like the Phoenicians. They're super interesting to me. But the truth is, is we don't have a whole lot of archaeological evidence for Phoenicians. And your readings will address that a bit. So let's talk about what we do know about the Phoenicians. So let's look at them. This is how they're depicted in 
uh, relief art from the Near East. Here are Phoenicians bringing gifts for the Persian king in about 5th century BC. And down here at the right is uh, a 9th century BC depiction of Phoenicians uh, in the uh, Neo-Assyrian era bringing exotic gifts such as monkeys. So why do we know so little? As I said before, refer to your readings, uh, partly because of uh, oh, racist bias, to be perfectly honest, um, and partly because some of the main Phoenician centers, quite honestly, are under uh, modern metropolises. So we only get the odd, uh, you know, uh, view when during construction. Um, uh, when it's reported, I would add, <laughs> uh, when somebody accidentally sort of uh, uh, penetrates into an archaeological site. Um, there's been recent work, uh, quite a bit actually, um, with respect to understanding patterns of Phoenician uh, settlements in particular and motivations for those settlements and, and their engagements with indigenous populations. Uh, a woman by the name of Maria Eugenia Obey Semler is responsible for a lot of that work. Uh, I, have, I have it straight from a few of her students. She's a Spanish professor and she, a lot of her work, I mean, is, it's wonderful that she's doing it, but it's, it's not perfect, let us say, uh, based on on the opinions of, of some of her students. But we're, you know, we have to start someplace. And what we didn't have is, is there any, you know, any formidable body of scholarship on the topic of Phoenicians uh, in the past. So uh, I, for one, am incredibly grateful to Obey for at least um, focusing her career on this topic. Um, I also <coughs> have, uh, if you, if you take a search out there, you'll find that some other authors are involved uh, with writing about Phoenicians and new work is coming up all the time. I spied in, in, a, in a recent scholarly search a, a dissertation that caught my eye. So when I get some of that elusive spare time, I look forward to thumbing through 1300 or more pages in French. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, on the, the Phoenician ports. I laugh, I read French, fine, but I don't read it as fast as I read English, so it could take a little time. Anyway, it sounds really interesting. It's, it's on Phoenician ports. So where are they from? Phoenicians uh, are from the, the, the uh, eastern uh, littoral region of the Mediterranean, in particular uh, the Levant, um, they're, uh, some, two of the, their largest cities, according to, uh, the, uh, ancient scholarship are, uh, Tyre and, uh, Byblos. Um, all these other cities, though, are also very important during this time period that this, the Phoenicians were, were not a certainly a political entity. They are a cultural entity. Each one of these cities is an independent city, city state, which would have uh, had allegiance to uh, one dominant figure or another during the span of time. Uh, so often uh, they, their masters would have been uh, Assyrians or uh, Neo-Assyrians or Neo-Babylonians or Persians, depending on who was in charge of the region at what time. Most of these overlords would have left them more or less, even Egypt was, was in here at one point in time, most of these overlords would have left them more or less their own devices because the Phoenicians were a seafaring uh, group and especially uh, those entities that were centered in Mesopotamia they relied on Phoenicians heavily for ships in times of warfare and for the imports of resources and luxury goods that the Phoenicians 
uh, managed to get from their sea travels. So they were getting a, given a fair amount of license, but had to pay heavy tribute in the way of those resources and luxury goods. So why were they important? Well, I've kind of told you in a way why they were important to various powers in Mesopotamia and Egypt because they connected with the rest of the Mediterranean. And that is really important because as a culture, they are bridging an entire sea, connecting people everywhere, getting resources from as far west as Spain, bringing them to as far east as, as the Mesopotamian River Valley and potentially beyond. So they, they're really important in terms of uh, cultural connections and uh, sh uh, cultural sharing and exchange of ideas. Not just ideas like, hey, isn't this a cool ship? But ideas with respect to social organization too. One of the things that we think that they did was to identify areas of important resources, establish more or less um, a community that could access those resources, entice that community to guard those resources and supply them, um, and potentially extract similar and more resources like them from neighboring communities. They would entice individuals within their core community um, with the notion of, of wealth um, and gaining access to luxury items and things that would be exclusive to those individuals, thus creating social, like seriously, uh, def uh, how should I say, distinct social hierarchies where they didn't exist before. So they probably played a major role in changing uh, social structures and uh, some economic structures uh, throughout the Mediterranean. So they are really important. We already know that they transferred ideas about, uh, about uh, the alphabet and so forth. <clears throat> but they weren't interesting, interested in taking over places. Right? They were interested in making those connections, getting the resources they wanted. They set up settlements, but they're mostly uh, trading settlements or emporia. Uh, another Greek word, I'm sorry. So here in this map, which shows you basically where they went, which is everywhere throughout the Mediterranean and even beyond. We haven't done a lot of work, but but we're sure that they they crossed and went through the gates of Gibraltar, uh, Gibraltar at the far western end and probably skirted up the coast of Portugal and down the uh, uh, western coast of Africa. You can see that all these little white dots were places that they set up. Uh, colonies, quite honestly, that doesn't even show the whole picture. There's way more than that. They tended to focus on particular types of places to set up colonies. Um, again, they didn't want to take over the hinterland. They didn't. Most colonies, especially in the initially, initially, most colonies were for the purpose of trade. Uh, They're with warehouses and harbors. Um, and places to connect with indigenous peoples. Later, certainly uh, after the establishment of Carthage in the ninth century, we'll start to see that some colonies seem to have a, a different motivation. Phoenician versus Punic, that's a good place to put that. So I've talked a couple of times throughout this presentation about the establishment of Carthage in the ninth century. And then I, last time I mentioned a disconnection between the people of Carthage and the motherland over here in the Eastern Mediterranean. The people from Carthage were supposed to have come from the city of Tyre and there are various, well, there's, there's a myth uh, told in, from various perspectives about that. Um, perhaps uh, we think that the, the motivation, the key motivation for the people of the of Carthage that left Tyre was uh, uh, pol political 
uh, factionism and perhaps the threat of a, a new ruling elite on the lives of the people that left. They seem to have taken with them um, uh, enough people to specifically start a new settlement. Their goal was not to just establish an emporium, but to establish sort of a whole new, uh, col a whole new tire, you know, a new a colony, a new place to live. They also make sure they bring priests with them um, to everything that they, so that they have everything they need to establish an entirely new um, uh, settlement, social, uh, cultural center. After that establishment of Carthage, um, uh, the, it, it, Carthage, Carthage grows and uh, prospers, and the people at Carthage, who now consider themselves very separate entities to the people of Tyre, they don't consider themselves sort of a daughter of Tyre, daughter city, they're, they're very separate, um, they begin on a different agenda, partly of trade, partly of colonization, while the people from Tyre or Byblos or, or Sidon, all in there, are primarily interested in mercantile connections. The people from Carthage start to seem to be interested in more than mercantile connections. And so the activities of the people from Carthage that seem to imply more than mercantile connections um, are activities by, uh, that we label Punic. And the activities of the peoples from the homeland of Tyre and, and Byblos, um, et cetera, are, are activities that we label Phoenician. So that's really the difference between those two terms. So when Rome engages in the Punic Wars, the three wars, with, um, th they're with the people of Carthage, not with the people that are coming from the Western Mediterranean. So I hope that clarifies that. So Phoenicians, they're great seafarers. Um, the pictures in the right uh, show some examples. The bottom right one is a, a relief of a, Phoeni a Phoenician ship. Uh, the, the one on the top right is remnants of, of uh, part of a Phoenician shipwreck that was found um, off the coast of Sicily, and I, that's from a museum in the city of Marsala on the southern coast of Sicily. So Carthage, right? Carthage, as I, I uh, said before, is in northern Africa. Here we are here at Carthage. Uh, looking closer, you can see that Carthage is located on a hill. All these lines are contour lines and Carthage is on the highest part of this, this hill. And in this area, this high part is labeled the, the Birsa. And so here's a couple of examples of some of the ruins um, at uh, Birsa. Uh, oh. Now, one of the things that a lot of people are interested in with respect to the Phoenicians, um, and that includes people like the Greeks and the Romans, is one of the practices of the Phoenicians that they get kind of a bad rap for. The Greeks don't like the Phoenicians much. Uh, that's largely probably because they're competing with them, uh, both for... Uh, trade and uh, for uh, colonial space. Um, and so they basically called them a bunch of baby killers. So scholarship, fine, and uh, we, we all like the macabre a little bit, don't we? You know, the, the weird, the profound. Um, so scholars have been attracted to this, this accusation of Greeks um, as the Phoenicians, as baby killers. And in truth, uh, the Phoenicians did practice infant sacrifice, but to our knowledge, they only practiced it, practiced it uh, in times of uh, extreme circumstance, advent of war, or an army surrounding the city gates, or uh, drought, 
or pestilence, some thing in which they were sure that the gods were punishing them and they desperately needed the help of the gods. In those times, they are said to have practiced infant sacrifice. Now, we're not talking about infants of the lowliest slaves. They had to be, I mean, if you're going to offer an infant to a god, I guess you need to offer him the best. So it was the responsibility of the elite families to supply their children at those extreme times of need. So if you were lucky, you could go through generation after generation and generation and not actually need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, sacrifice your children. But if it had to happen, uh, then again, the elite families were the ones that were to supply them. Now, scholars, um, when they first started to explore Phoenician uh, settlements, found these, these necropolis, these special grave yards, these special cemeteries, that only seemed to have the remains of small children. So initially they're like, oh my gosh, the Greeks were right. They're just crazy. They're baby killers. Oh my gosh, those Phoenicians, they're horrible. Truth is, is that notion of sacrificing children in extreme times to the gods is one that's very old and even has examples in the Bible, um, including uh, Abraham's attempt to uh, sacrifice Isaac. He does this because that's what you do to please the gods and that's what you do in times of extreme. Abraham's God, however, stops him from doing it. But the point is, is, is cultures of the Near East did this um, uh, as a way to appease the gods. Now, there's still debate as to how much those Phoenicians did sacrifice children. But most of the evidence seems to point now that all of the children in these special graveyards, these special cemeteries, which, by the way, are called Tophets. Most of those children were not sacrificed that are in the Tophets. Most of those children seem to be under the age of, I think it's three. And we think that the, the due to high infant mortality rates throughout the Mediterranean at this period of time, that the Phoenicians, like other cultures, probably had a special sort of community ceremony in which a child was had he or she survived infancy, right, and uh, grew to be beyond the age of three, would have some kind of ceremony to welcome into his community, into his family, and into his community. That way, the death of so many children, I mean, presumably is not shared, uh, and the grief is not uh, shared by the whole community. So... So we think that most of the infants in these Tophets, not all, because there's definitely evidence that some of them were sacrificed, but most of them were those that died of uh, stillbirths or died in early infancy or early childhood. And, but because they had not gone, undergone that, that ceremony of social uh, inclusion into their communities, they're buried in this very special uh, necropolis and they all have these little grave markers here's a um, just a little uh, a few examples of uh, some vessels found in Carthage uh, interesting to show you that the ones uh, on the left the, the drawings and the vessel at the bottom are both examples of Greek pottery Greek pottery from the island of Euboea. Now, Eubeans are the Greeks that first settled on that little island of Ischia, off the southern coast of Italy, in that site called Pithecusae that I mentioned earlier in this presentation. And they are early explorers, Greek explorers of the Mediterranean. We think they were active as early as the 8th century BC. So, it's interesting to find their stuff at a, uh, uh, a Punic site. Other um, interesting uh, things at the site of Carthage are these different amphorae. These four different vessels are a special kind of amphorae. They are transport amphorae. <clears throat> the reason I know they're transport amphorae 
is because of the bottoms of them. Notice that none of them will stand up. And that's because they were not designed to stand up. They were designed to fit in between a whole layer of ones that are, that are, that are leaned up against each other in the hull of a ship. And then you would then start the second layer by sticking those pointy bottoms in between four other vessels to, for a second layer. So that's how they would stack most securely and they could maximize space in the hull of a ship. And they would carry all kinds of things, wine and oil and perfume. Here's a, uh, an a couple more archaeological finds from Carthage. These date, uh, this little necklace dates to the seventh century BC, made of gold, and the one uh, the earrings date to the sixth century BC, also gold. I want to also show you one of the uh, Western colonies, and the the uh, in particular the Western colony on the island of uh, Motia or Motsia. It's actually both are, are reasonable uh, pronunciations. One is more uh, ancient and one is uh, more modern. So here we are just to get uh, get your bearings here. Here's our Mediterranean Sea. And if we look here, this half green island of Sicily, we're going to look at the left part, the green portion. Um, looking here at the island of Sicily, looking at that left portion, you can see here this big dot is Motia. Actually, there were three substantial uh, Phoenician colonies on the western side of the island. Also shown on this picture is the site of Salonunte, which is a Greek colony that was by no means the only Greek colony on that island. But this this particular picture is meant to show you just the you know what's going on in the western part of the island. Also wanted to you know just bring to your attention that it's not terribly far from Carthage here on the northern tip of, of Africa. And then finally the map over in the right here um, shows uh, the settlement itself. If you look at the, this, this corner version, you can see that the settlement is actually located on a little island here with a great harbor, right? And, the, <clears throat> and uh, this was the way that Phoenicians did it. They would, use, they would settle on islands. This would have been very, um, how should I say, would, uh, sheltered from winds and so forth and made a fantastic harbor. That's what they looked for harbors and they didn't want to infiltrate on the mainland and they wanted to sort of keep their own space not intimidate and not uh, confront in any negative way so a couple of finds from the sites of motia this one on the left is an interesting and slightly strange vessel which i honestly can't tell you what its use is it's actually reminiscent to something a bit strange that call uh, <coughs> that uh, I, I've seen um, certainly in uh, Minoan or Bronze Age Crete. But anyway, what's particularly interesting to me and with respect to the Phoenicians is two things. Number one, the kind of minimalist decoration on here. That's really common. These like just little few black squiggly lines. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is the color of the clay, that is very, very red. Phoenician vessels that were made in, in, the, in North Africa were made with, obviously, with North, North African clays, and they all have this very, very red uh, clay. So this is something that wouldn't have been made in Motia, would have been probably made in the Carthaginian region and then imported to Motia. And also what we see there, you remember I showed you those Greek vessels in Carthage? I would just bring to your attention that in here in the settlement of Motia, um, we also see a number of Greek vessels, not just from Euboea this time, but also from places like Carthage. I can just see, look at this, and uh, not Car did I say Carthage, sorry, places like um, Corinth. I can tell you that this vessel and this vessel in particular are definitively from Corinth. So, 
you can, the, you know, we get some bad references from Greeks about Phoenicians, but there clearly is a lot of exchange and inter interchange between these two cultures. And any uh, most emporia, uh, Phoenician emporia, did not have tuffets. We only find tuffets at places where we see a settlement that's actually not just meant as a mercantile spot, but meant as some kind of permanent um, uh, town that was settled, you know, with the intention of a long-term stay. And Motier clearly was one of those, probably settled from people from the Punic element at Carthage. And so there they are um, with their tuffet. So yes, they, they also had a, an infant burial ground. And here, uh, these are both taken. These are some of the gravestones that were found, and these are in the museum, but these two pictures are uh, <clears throat> from the tuffet itself on the island. So in Spain, uh, especially in the southern coast of Spain uh, and the eastern coast of Spain, we see lots and lots and lots of, of Phoenician sett settlements. So here's a picture of southern Spain and here's a picture of the Mediterranean. You can see here all this green portion, which more or less equates to what you're seeing big on the map here. And here's a vessel. There's a jug, 7th century from a necropolis, in, a, a tomb in the necropolis in uh, Spain. Also, we find activity, as I mentioned before, and it's not on your map here, because I think this, this map obviously is not as, as current as, as the, the one on the right. But as I said, it goes up the, the coast of Portugal as well. Let's see, so these are all uh, where we have found uh, Phoenician uh, artifacts. And just to, 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 to clarify that, uh, whoops, sorry, that, uh, uh, uh when we're talking about, uh, Carthage, uh, I'm sorry, that the people with whom Rome is having, uh, three major battles, uh, which we label the, the Punic Wars. They're with the people of Carthage. Um, the last of the Punic Wars resulted in the total demolishing of the city of Carthage. They completely razed the entire city, poured salt over it in hopes that it would never be inhabited again, completely demolished it to the point that they would never cause them problems again. And indeed, Carthage never caused Rome problems again, but it was eventually rehabilitated. And that's it. So just a little over two hours today. Hey, I can want to remind you, if we did this in class, you'd be sitting there for three hours. So I hope you enjoyed uh, my presentation on two uh, of the prominent peoples in the Mediterranean Sea during the Iron Age. And we, you'll hear from me some more next week when we uh, focus thematically on the countryside um, of the classical world. And we're back to your, your, your textbook um, about classical ar archeology span starting next week. Okay, I think it'll be a shorter uh, presentation next week as well. Yay. All right. Thank you again.